you seem to not be a backseat type of guy. No, I, I enjoy it though. You know, like I enjoy uh, the process of creation. You know, it's fun to me. It's uh, it's no different than basketball. Like I enjoy playing. And I got very lucky in the sense of when I stepped away from the game of basketball, I found something that I loved equally. So mm -hmm. um, that's why. Nice. All right. Well, you started off, I know, with a ton of pressure. Expectations put on you to be like the next Michael Jordan, straight out of high school. And I'm sure people ask you how you manage that pressure. But I think probably if I had to guess, you put most of the pressure on yourself. It wasn't necessarily from the outside. Yeah, you know, like I, I had goals, you know, I had expectations and things I wanted to accomplish, you know, and so like the outside world uh, could not meet that for sure. Like, mm -hmm. I, I knew I wanted to win like five, six, seven yeah. championships. You know what I mean? That was my goal. For me to come out and say that, people would think I was a lunatic. Yeah. You know, so no matter what they said or what they threw at me, my expectations were certainly higher. Why, why continually do that? I mean, it, it seems obvious to probably to you and, and somebody like me who constantly like, I wouldn't say necessarily beat myself up, but is constantly reigniting the fire under my own ass, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems a little bit masochistic to keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But you know, you can't, you can't control that passion, man. You know, sometimes you just kind of have a fire and you need to, you need to keep those flames burning. Yeah. Man, nothing you can do about it. Like you, you, you don't really have much of a choice. Like you wake up in the morning and you go. Even if you tried to dial it back, mm -hmm. it'll just build up and build up, and then it'll just like come out ten times worse than it was before. Yeah, you know, you, yeah. You can't really control it. Did you ever try to do that? Like when you were younger, did you? How do you know that it comes out ten times worse? I mean, it sounds like that happened at some point. Yeah, like you know, when you go on vacations, you go on vacations. You say, you know, I'm gonna take my mind off of it. Not gonna think about it, and you can do that for a couple of days, three days. You know what I mean, something like yeah. that. But then when you get back to it, all of a sudden it's like a like, it, things just pour out of you. Your show on ESPN called it's actually called Detail, and my yeah. friend goes, "You got to watch this." Kobe breaks things down into minute detail. I was like, "Ah, okay." I expect you to be like, "Ah, he's gonna run up here, and he's gonna." I mean, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know as much about basketball or anywhere close as you do. But it was like, see, if he takes a step laterally, but if he takes a step 45 degrees this way, and I'm like, okay, this is a level <laughs> of detail that nobody really looks at for business, for any game. And I wonder if you take your business now and you look at, all right, this is the level of detail I need in my creative endeavor. Because I looked, I looked in there for a second. I didn't go in, but there's a lot of post-it notes on that wall, yeah. a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, like, we try to handle things with great care. When you handle things with great care, you have no choice but to look at every single detail. You know, in the books that we create, in the films that we create, we look over every scene, comb through every line. You know, we go through everything. The the book that I'm sure you know we'll get into, but like even looking at this book here, you look on the back here. This is a barcode. Oh yeah. Right, but instead of just slapping a barcode on the book, you got to make sure that it comes from the world. Right, so how can you design a barcode that, that's effective and efficient, but still designed to fit the part of the world? So going through every single detail is the same thing. Right, because this, otherwise you look at the book, right, it breaks the whole, like, this is like magical. Right? Yeah, you don't want to break the magic. And then you can't have like, wall, no, right, I exactly. shouldn't say that, but you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. no, 100%, yeah. 100%. And so it's like, the same thing I do in basketball is the same thing we do here. And, um, you know, you got to obsess over every little thing. Because, like, by law, you got to have probably the price, the ISBN exactly number, right. the barcode, but nobody says it has to be ugly, exactly. be on a sticker. Just with slap it on there, yeah. and then off you go. No, 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 no. We want to make sure we go through everything. There's even, I know people who are watching this can't really tell, but this is like, what are you, AstroTurf kind of <laughs> golf? Uh, it's a prestige material. Yeah, prestige yeah. material. Like, you can feel there's a tactile thing. So as soon as the kid or the adult like me, or the grown-up kid, yeah. picks this thing up, like, you feel that somebody, you thought about this. That's exactly right. And, yeah. I, and that's really important too, because like, you know, when parents pick up a book and try to decide what book they want to buy for their children, or when a kid picks up a book, um, we want them to have the experience of somebody put a lot of thought and care into it, mm -hmm. right? Because generally in the children's space, children's book space, you kind of just make books and you just, you know, as cheaply as you can make yeah. them and you churn them out. Um, but the message we want to come across, we want to get across is that, you know, kids matter like investing heavily in kids is extremely important in fact more important than it is investing in adults because children are our future so instead of spending all of our resources and doubling down on the grown-ups let's double down on kids
did you think about this stuff before you had kids or was this like, I just had a kid same age as uh, I think Capri, your daughter, maybe a little younger, like right, six congrats, weeks right man. now. Thank congrats. you. It's, a, it's an amazing feeling and everyone goes, it's going to turn your world upside down. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I was like, yeah, 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 okay. And then you, ha- and yeah. then you go, whoa. You're like, whoa, wait a minute. Drive slowly, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, it alters things. Like, you know, Natalia, our eldest is now 16. And it certainly changes things. So, so like creating these stories was really for them because they're, my, you know, our daughters are athletes. And yeah. uh, you're trying to find stories for them, you know, characters, first of all, that look like them is close to impossible. And then secondly, finding characters that look like them, but are, that are also athletic. Right. It's like. And when you say look like them, like, let's not sugarcoat it. You mean African-American women. Yeah, like- my, my kids are mixed. So my wife's Latina. I'm mm-hmm. obviously African-American. And so, you know, the, the, the finding mixed characters is like. Yeah. Needle in the haystack. My son and then when Asian. you try to have Asian. Yeah. Okay. So find good luck finding characters that yeah. are, have that. Right. So, um, and then on top of that, they're athletes. So where are these stories for children that center around athletes, you know, biracial children. Um, and, uh, and that also intertwine the entertaining fundament, fun uh, part yeah. of it all, which is like magic and fantasy and mystery. Yeah, it's, it is tough. I do think about that because I obviously grew up like, pretty generic white dude in the suburbs. There was one or there was one Asian kid in my school, right. one African American kid at my school, and right. they stuck out, everyone liked them, and it was like a special thing. Sure. But yeah, there weren't a whole lot of movies with like heroes that looked like them, characters that looked like them, yeah. that weren't just stereotypes. Yeah. And that's not really good for you growing up. My son, he's half uh, Taiwanese Chinese, so he looks like an old Asian man because he's like six weeks old and all that. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> but like, yeah, there's not a whole lot that's going to look like him. It's going to be like half, he can look at Jet Li and be like, kind of like that, but also kind of like nobody else. Yeah, and it's important, you know, not, and we, we tend to look at it from the side of like my daughter's perspective, right, of um, being the only African-American or mixed kid in school. And, you know, and what does that feel like? If you're yeah. not the only one, there's maybe two more, right? But on the flip side of that as well is that the other children, the majority of the children in the school aren't getting an opportunity to understand different cultural backgrounds either, right? And so there's there's kind of an understanding that takes place or, or, or a lack of understanding that takes place on both sides of that equation, which is why it's very important to be able to have diverse characters. Um, so this way we can all kind of better understand each other. Can you make sure his audio level, can you monitor consistently, please? I can't not direct and do that. It's like, all good, man. I know like- I get it. I feel like you probably have that same thing. I do. I try not to micromanage, but I'm also like, I know though. I yeah, know like I, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's funny, it's, it's pretty, it's easier for me. Like in, in basketball, it's a little different. Here, it's, 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 you know, it's easier for me because I have great people that know what the hell they're doing. Like I didn't go to film, film school, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So I, there's certain things I don't know. Like I don't know production schedules or SAG rules or any other yeah. stuff. I don't know that stuff, but I have people that do. Yeah. And um, you, know, you trust them to do the best that they can with lighting and things of that nature. But I wonder, are you doing a lot of the outside the box thinking? Like who came up like with the barcode idea? Like, hey, that, was one, that was one of our creatives in here that yeah. came up with that idea. You know, my, my direction is always do not break the magic. You know, we do don't compromise that. Do not break the magic. Everything comes from this world. Everything has purpose and everything must be to the to the best of your ability. So like my job is really to make sure that, you know, when you work here, you're, you're tasked with challenging yourself to do the best job you can. And that means you have to be honest mm-hmm. and be brave about it. Like you gotta be able to look in the mirror and say, I can do better, right? It's gotta be tough working for somebody like you who wants liter- like wants every percent out of everything, but also yeah. go, ooh, I've gotta tell them that this is the wrong decision. So you have to build trust with your team so that they can look you in the face and go, you know what, I, I see where your head's at, yeah. but that is a bad idea. But you know what though, they generally get it though. You know, like if you're new and you're working here, you come into a meeting, you have an idea for a creative for a cover, for example, and we sit down and we talk. And one thing that I'm a big proponent of is a simple image. A, a, simple, sim- image? a simple image, a simple, clean image that has a lot of layers to it, right? Which is easier said than done. Mm-hmm. Right, but that's a mandate. Okay, now I understand as a company, this is what you're looking for, right? And then they go off and they create. It just takes you know, maybe a week or two just to kind of get used to you know, yeah. the style of how we do things. Sure. But by and large, the people that we have here are all obsessives. 
So like me you saying, like, that. I don't have to say needle over every detail until it's right. Like they're, that's already in them. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. so when they come here, they're like, oh, thank God I can work in a company that's going to obsess over every single detail. That makes sense. You hire for that. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to. Because otherwise, yeah. it's like you picking the whole roster. Yeah. We'd go crazy if, if it wasn't that way, you know? And the, the, the challenging part is continuing to find those people. Yeah. And uh, I can imagine. Yeah, it's tough. Because people always, people love to say, oh, I've read this job uh, description and it says you've got to be obsessed with quality and detail. And you're like, I'm that person. But everybody wants to think they're that person. Yeah. But when it gets time, like, hey, you got to work on the weekend because the feeling of the paper on the cover is wrong and you got to feel 300 other samples, they're like, what? Yeah. It's a book, man. Chill. I got yeah. stuff to do. That's exactly right. It's, well, why? Yeah. Why does it matter? Mm hmm. Well, it matters because it matters. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, and fortunately for us, we have people that are like that. And and now the challenge becomes, and as we grow, continuing to uh, have those standards, never dropping those standards, and uh, and going from there. I've heard and seen you break down games, for example, that you've lost in the past, and it seems like you can really detach emotionally. Like when I listen to something that I do wrong, I depending on how wrong it goes can sit there and sort of cold calculate like a surgeon, go through it. Yeah. But other times I'm beating myself up. And I, I have not seen you do that. You seem like you have an emotional detachment that's probably pretty healthy when you're trying to get something fixed. Yeah, yeah. It comes from one of our coaches in the past. His name is Tex Winter. And we used to watch game film. He was pretty brutal on us as players. Yeah. But he always said, I'm not criticizing the person. I'm criticizing the act. Mm -hmm. Right, so remove yourself from that. Remove the ego from this process and just focus on the act. The goal is to help us all become better. And when you do that, you can kind of remove yourself from that. Now you can look at actions and then you can truly improve, you know, as a basketball player. I can't remember where this was. You mentioned you studied actors to get mindset. It was kind yeah. of a throwaway line. But I'm wondering who you studied the most. Like, who are you watching your like? I love that cold ass shit from whoever in this movie. Um, Hilary Swank and I had a lot of conversations about that actually. And um, uh, talked to Kate Winslet about it as well. Um, but we, we really got into how they build their characters and how they get into character. Uh, I've spoken with Larry Moss about that process mm -hmm. as well. And there's something to that because like as an actor, you are trained to get into that zone, find that pocket. And as athletes, the psychology is the same. You know, the, 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 the Sean Penn as well. We had a great conversation about it as well. Um, the discipline is different, but the behavior is the same. And before you start a game, how can you lock in? You get into that mental space where nothing else matters. You're completely locked in and focused on what you're trying to accomplish as an athlete out here. The noise of the crowd doesn't matter. Whether the cheering or booing doesn't matter. You're just completely locked in. How do you do that? It seems like they're on set, right? But you're and you're on set, you're on the court, but you have feedback from people you don't necessarily want. You yeah. know, if you do something wrong, you got all these people giving you negative feedback. You have to be able to block that out. They don't really have to do that. Yeah. It's, it's 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 well, you know, you could say, you know, being an actor is there's more pressure involved in it because you're dealing with a smaller audience when you're on set. Mm. Right. And so the criticism is is you know, it's it's a one to one. <laughs> type of yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Somebody's looking at you in judgment. When you're in a crowd with thousands of people, you know, because of the size of it, it tends to, to, to diminish the pressure. It's like when you're speaking in front of a thousand people, it's like a sea of n not even one. It does like, it's like it's less than one, it's less personal. Right. It's just a sea It's of like if, if we go in and have a conversation in, you know, in a bar in front of a bunch of people, um, that are having their own conversations and every once in a while turn around and looking at us having our own conversation. Okay. But now if you walk in and there's two people that are doing nothing but watching and critiquing our conversation, that's a little different. That must actually happen to <laughs> you in real life all the time now that I think about well, it. Well, now with camera phones, yeah, I get yeah. that a lot, man. People just sit there and just kind of do this. And just kind of listen. <laughs> <laughs> so they sit there. Filming you and like, I'm just looking at the menu and scratching yeah, yeah, my face yeah, with my yeah, phone. Yeah, that's so annoying, that's by the way. That's so weird. So annoying. Like, at least just be blatant about it. Like, yeah. it's not like I can't see you like doing this, you know. It's... What do you do? Do you, you must say something or do you nah, just, I just, of... I just let it be. Yeah. I just let it be. But I feel like I couldn't eat if somebody was filming me. I'd be like, I gotta yeah. make sure. Or you I... could just do like the most inappropriate thing ever and get them like... Yeah, hit, hit the meat. <laughs> Kobe gets mustard on his chin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
I heard you once actually say you wanted to be the Will Smith of basketball. I don't remember saying that. You don't but remember I, saying I must that? have said it, but I don't remember saying that. You know, actually, I heard it secondhand. I think it was Shaq who said it. Yeah. About you. Maybe he was just playing, but I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't remember saying that. I mean, I, no, not that that would be a bad thing, but yeah. I, like, I don't remember saying it. I just think it's a funny comment because it actually, you could have said pretty much anybody, but it aged decent. I mean, he's doing all right. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's turned out to be one of the best actors of our generation, yeah. so it worked out. Yeah. So when when you when you were in the locker room, you had the Halloween theme song playing on repeat, which mm -hmm. aside from being hella creepy, I assume is a way to get into some sort of alter ego or emotional state. Yeah, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about before, getting in the character. Yeah. You know, and how do you kind of get your mind frame wrapped around to a place where uh, nothing else matters? And you got to find those songs that can channel that for you. That's why, you know, music for me wasn't just like, what's popular now, but it's like music that can take you to an emotional space. Um, smells like teen spirit mm -hmm. was one of my favorite ones to listen to because it would take me back to high school. Like if I'm playing in a game, a heavy pressure game, right? Game seven of a playoff series. I listen to smells like teen spirit. Why? Because it took me back to high school where basketball was just fun and you were playing with friends and there was, you know, all this hype and media wasn't around. You're just in a gym with like 200 people in the stands in high school watching you play. And that song would take me back to that place. And then emotionally, that's where I would be when I would perform. Do you still do you still rock songs when you got to do something really important? Or is it now so on autopilot? Uh, I, yeah, sometimes, sometimes, yeah. Like I, I'll, I'll listen to Jay-Z a lot. Okay. I listen to Jay-Z a lot, and, you know, the, the new stuff as well as um, you know, the Reasonable Doubt album. I listen to the roots. I listen to quite a bit you know, when I have a chance to. Right now, it's like so many things that we're churning. Like mm -hmm. I, I, it's, you know. But I, I'm, a, I'm a big, I'm a big lover of music. I, I was wondering. I was like, wouldn't it be funny if he's got like Taylor Swift in his car? I do. Really? Yeah, I do. I do. I think it's important to listen to people who do great things. You know, so it's not just uh, genre specific, but it's like you know, Taylor's been at the top of the game for a very, very long time. Yeah. How and why? You know, how does she write? How does she get into that mental space to be able to create things over and over and over? I mean, it's it's a lot of pressure for her to follow up a number one album with a better album yeah, then yeah. follow it with a better. Like, I don't care if you like her music or if you don't like her music. Look at what she's a, what she's doing. I mean, that's frightening stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable to be able to pull that off over and over and over and over. And so I look at things like that to try to learn from them as much as I can. She's a shark, too. Like, you, you hear about her standing up to Spotify or all these. I mean, she Metallica did that in the early, when you and I were probably in, like, I don't know, college, high school. Yeah. But, like, uh, that's tough. Or you didn't think she would be like, no, I'm not going to do, I'm going to do it my way. And yeah, but see, like, from, from afar, like, I know she has to be that way. Mm -hmm. You know, she's she's a sweet um, kid. I mean, she was a sweetheart to my girls before she even blew up and became Taylor Swift. So that's why, like, I always, if she needs anything from me, I'm always there. But you can't have that level of consistent success and not be a killer. It's impossible. That's great. That's it's funny impossible. To, it's funny to think of Taylor Swift as a, kill, as a Absolutely killer. Absolutely is. She totally is. 100%. The Mike Myers mask from the Halloween theme song, devoid of emotion. Is that a coincidence or is that something you were? No, no, about? it's it's one hundred percent intentional. Uh, that's the game. That's the trick of the game, man. Is like, can you again detach yourself from it? Can you remove your emotions from the situation? Emotions get in the way a lot, especially in competitive, uh, in competitive uh, situations. Do you find that in business then too? Yeah, yeah. Business too. Like you get emotional and start making decisions. You know, you got to kind of sit back and look at it for what it is, and is is it the right decision to make? Yeah, everybody who lost money on Bitcoin knows what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> Emotions. Yep. Yeah, you're clearly dedicated to mastery and everything that you do. And I think most people, again, just like people who say they're obsessed with detail, they only pay lip service to that. Like yeah. they say, like, oh, I'm obsessed with with mastery. But I was looking up. Kobe Bryant work ethic stories. It's like a Google search that, that <laughs> apparently I'm not the only one who made it. And there are some <laughs> trainers that are anonymous online being like, yeah, he texted me at 445 in the morning, wanted to go work out. I worked out with him, went back to my hotel room, went to sleep, came back in the morning. He was doing some shooting. And I said, oh, what time did you finish? And you were like, just now. Yeah. And the guy was like, did you show up seven hours early for a scrimmage? <laughs> and that's that's like this. The Internet has a million of those. Yeah. And 
I'm wondering if you instill that same level of work ethic in your kids or if you're like, okay, maybe that was a little bit much. Um, no, yeah, I, I do. But, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you do it by repetition, you know, by just simply the act of working every day. Like you can't talk your children into working hard. I mean, that's the one thing that drives me crazy is like, you know, I have parents come up to me on the street or, you know, when I'm at the sports academy and they're saying, okay, you know, how can I get my kid to work hard? What do I need to tell? Can you talk to my kid? I say, listen, it's not a, something that you can talk through. It's a behavioral thing. You have to get up every day and do the work, right? Consistently do the work. My kids, volleyball, um, basketball, schoolwork, they work every day. And that's how you instill it in them, where it becomes a behavioral thing. And it doesn't matter what they decide to do. Like if Gianna decides to not play basketball when she grows up, that's fine. But she understands the discipline that it takes to work at something every single day. So whether she wants to be a writer, a director, a doctor, a lawyer, she'll have those characteristics. Yeah, if you could talk your kids into working hard, I feel like every parent would Every parent would work out. hard. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. it's the behavior. And also it's like, it's, it's observing, it's seeing you like, and it's not just me, it's my wife too. Like, you know, her commitment to the children and making sure that they're, they're on point, schedule, schoolwork, every, like everything is sharp. Everything is, you know, there every single day, man. And seeing me get up and train and work hard. And I used to take them with me sometimes too. I used to take them to the gym when I would train and they would do things on the side where I'd, we'd go to the track together and they'd, I'd be running around the track and doing this sort of stuff. This way they can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did they ever come in here and watch you guys work? Oh, yeah. 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 I think the example has to be where it's at because a lot of parents are do as I say, not as I do. And we, know how that works out yeah that that works from time to time yeah. especially if like you're driving in the car and you're like okay just do as i say not as i do right <laughs> you know? yeah um, but like with work habits they got to be able to see that stuff man do you take singular focus with everything you do i was talking to some of the players that you used to play with and they were like we'd invite him to vegas didn't want to go we invite him to play golf didn't want to go and they're like it's not that he was antisocial at all it just wasn't getting him closer to the goal of being the best at basketball yeah ever and so I'm wondering, is, is business the same? Is it like, no, I'm not going to do all... You have to say no a lot deliberately. Well, it's, it's, it's different because you know, we, I just don't have the time. Like, yeah. you, know, I, um, you know, Vanessa and I, we don't have uh, a nanny. We don't have a babysitter. You don't have a nanny at no, all? Wow. Never have. So, you know, other couples that go out and invite us to do things, we love to, but we have our kids, mm -hmm. you know, so we can't just, we can't leave them, you know? And then it's the work stuff. Like balancing work and family is hard and I'm really committed to work and I don't compromise time with my family. So the time that I'm not working, I'm spending it with them, mm -hmm. you know? And so you kind of lose out on some of the social things from time to time, but it is what it is. Yeah. I think, I, I think that's probably a matter of priority and passion. And I know yeah. when you went to the NBA, I've heard you say, look, a lot of guys, they're not working that hard. I mean, that's, that's yeah. kind of a legendary thing for you to to say about other players and they didn't have the same passion and you said even at 18 or I, I heard Shaq actually say even at 18 you wanted to be the best you found that passion early and you, you've said like if you're lucky you find that passion early but players oftentimes they lose that passion right they're playing for economic stability sure. they show up and they're like oh for the first time in my life I can go to Vegas and be and ball out and sure. be popular and famous and I'm sure. going to enjoy that how do you stay hungry? Because you might've had that situation too. I mean, you could just as easily have gone down that road, but you didn't. I, I didn't, I didn't enjoy it. You didn't enjoy no, it. No, I enjoyed playing basketball. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I, you know, and when I say that, um, people tend to have a tendency to take that lightly. Yeah. But no, I love the game. I love it. Right. I didn't want to be away from it. I wanted to play all the time. Like a lot of guys have f fun, hanging out in the pool in Vegas. And that's, that's it's fine. It's a time and place for that, right? But like when I was 18, 20, 21 years old, I wanted to play basketball. I was consumed with this quest of trying to be the best, you know, and we weren't there yet. I had to, there's so many things I had to figure out. Like am I training properly? Am I working on the right things on the court? There's so many things to do. I didn't have time to go and, you know, hang out over here. So what do you do practice wise? Like, do you have a ritual or practice that keeps you getting after it? Or is this just something that's been natural with you for a while? Cause yeah, you love basketball, but do you love creating magic books in the same way? 
Yeah, it's it's the same process, like the same attention to detail. And the thing about storytelling is crazy because like right now I put like a, a put a I put a stop on myself coming up with a new IP. Um, because we have a lot right now that we need to get out into the market. We got to focus on doing that right. Because what happens is I'll create a new character and then I'll say, okay, this is how the character is. And then I'll say, well, why is the character that way? Mm -hmm. Well, family situation. All right, what's his family like? Okay, then where did the father come from? Then where did the mother come from? And then, okay, well, where do they live? All right, now what are the rules of the world that they live in? And then, you know, it it just takes you down this rabbit hole where you just become all consuming. It becomes all consuming. And, uh, you know, I love that part. I love that part, though. So I'm kind of looking forward to diving back in. But that's my process. It's like some Lord of the Rings stuff right there. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And it's like books and books and stuff. Like even with this, this book here, there's, like, there's so many, I have so many notes and so many books filled with like, you know, Nova, like creating the name itself and like legacy and Sila and then like the rules of the world and the history of the kingdom of Nova when it once was a kingdom, like all of these sort of things that I have that the readers will never know, but it was important for me and Annie to go through. Do you do you read Lord of the Rings and books like that? That's no, a, no, I, no, I, I don't. Guess. I don't like. I've studied them though. Okay, which, which is weird. So like, yeah. like I'll, I'll, I've, uh, I'll read about someone who studied the Lord of the Rings, um, or watch video essays about it, and then watch speeches, and then same thing with Game of Thrones. You know, I'll go. Th- those are I have read though, and then. You read Game of Thrones? I have. I have. Wow. And, and then, like, sitting down with George, I had a chance to sit down with him and just pick his brain about stuff and, like, and learn. From, so I learned from, from all of these things. Yeah. Did, did, George seems like a guy who might have no idea who you are until he, he gets He loves sports. Football. Does he? Huge sports fan. Did not realize that. Huge. Huge. That's, that's kind of surprising. He seems like the kind of guy who, like, hangs out at the library all The day. exact opposite. That's like, fine. He's a huge sports fan and a huge history buff, obviously. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. A lot of players have different levels of physical ability. That goes without saying. But even people that you say are legends in the game, they have different levels of physical ability. So if we take physical ability out of the equation, what do you think it is that allows somebody to be to be great at anything? It doesn't have to just be basketball. I think I think it's how do you negotiate with yourself. I think that's the biggest thing. Is uh, we talk about the mental side of it, but then like, what does that really mean? like the thoughts that happen in your mind when you're going through a competitive situation or you're facing a tight deadline, you still don't have the idea yet. You know, what happens inside of here? You talk yourself out of it. Do you say, okay, well, it won't be a big deal if I don't do it or I don't have to get up on a Tuesday morning to go ahead and hit the track. What does this day really mean in the long scheme of things anyway? It's just one day. Mm -hmm. Like when you have those conversations with yourself, are you able to negotiate your way out of, you know, that little you know voice telling you it's not that important or does that little voice get the best of you i think that's what separates people who go on to do great things versus people who don't or people that do great things but in an inconsistent way do you call that out in like your kids when they're laying in bed and you're like i know what you're thinking you're thinking 15 more minutes but not today <laughs> yeah no I, um i let them i let them sleep in you know and that's the biggest thing as a parent um, is when they're late, you let them be late and you let them learn from that and you let them figure that out versus me telling them. Ah, uh, right. So you let them go through the consequences and go, oh, I hate rushing. And you're like, how could we have avoided this? Yeah. 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 But and it's like, you know, like, uh, like my basketball team, for example, when I have the girls run lines and, uh, you know, we could just as easily say, like I had a parent who was encouraging his daughter. He's running 17s and he's encouraging her. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. Dig deep, dig deep. And then after practice, I go to him and say, you know, when she's doing those line drills, don't say anything. Because there's a con- there's a conversation that's happening inside of her head. She's like talking to herself, trying to pump herself up to do it. She's already having those conversations. So for an outside voice to come in, to give her guidance and to give her uh the 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 kind of the 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 push to keep going actually interrupts her process. Just let her be, let her figure it out herself. Uh, because as they go through life as parents, we're not going to be there all the time. You know what I mean? So kids have to be able to navigate those things themselves. You've got to make hundreds of small decisions in the court, same in business, same in business, I assume. 
you're high profile though. You can't afford a misstep. How do you know who to listen to and who to trust? Well, I mean, that's the thing is that, you know, I, we don't want missteps, but they'll happen. It's fine. You know, high profile or not, it's fine. Sorry. I've, I've had them before. I'm sure we'll have them again. It's fine. You know, what, you, what I try to do is hire really great, good people and hire them and not do their job for them. Not do their job for them? Hire yeah. them for a reason. Do you have like a panel of people that you rely on for advice that you trust? Uh, when it comes to, to, to really big like you know, company sh strategy things, 10-year, 15-year type of things, mm -hmm. yeah, I do. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Mark Parker, uh, which I did, uh, Johnny Ives, uh, Tim Cook. Like, these are guys that I lean on. Oprah Winfrey, Shonda Ryan. Man, these are people that I'll, I'll lean on. It must be nice to have a roster of people that you know have. It's a pretty good roster. Up. Yeah, right. Like they yeah. haven't screwed up their lives yet. Yeah. They're doing pretty well. You can be like, well, yeah. what should I do? Have you fallen for this before? Because I feel like I'm getting played." Yeah, and yeah. we all. And it's funny is that we all make the same mistakes when we're all building, building things. And you know, you know uh, Oprah told me specifically that she's made a lot of the same mistakes that I've made when she first started her studio, and and uh, it gives you. Kind of let you know that you're on the right path. You know, you like you think while well, Disney built Disney and everything was perfect mm -hmm. and every made every right decision, and then you unpack and you're like, oh wait, he signed some really bad contracts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was you know financially really really struggling, and you know, it's okay. It's hard to remember that though. I would imagine in the moment, right? Or do you, I mean, do you really never beat yourself up over a bad decision? Because I'm just like, wow, that's like a unicorn mindset. No, I, I, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, there's literally nothing I can do about it other than look at why I made the decision I made, um, you know, what factors kind of fooled me into making the wrong decision. And you try to process that for the next time. You, know, you can kind of read the tea leaves on another decision sort mm -hmm. of thing. But other than that, that's it. You, you got you to gotta go. We got to move forward. All right, cool. That's done. Let's go. If you're using, let's say, Shaq as competitive fuel on the court, who are you using for competitive fuel in your business now? Do you have that same? I, I never, I never use others for competitive fuel. Like I, I would only do that for that extra like two percent at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, like the other ninety eight percent came from within. It just came from like the, the 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 love of of playing and the love of figuring things out. And so that's what I do here. Like it's the love of creating something, and I'm really excited because I feel like we're creating something new. Like the the world does not have stories like this. We do not have uh, sports fantasy stories. We don't have those. And so I become very excited about getting those out into the market. A lot of athletes, they get into trouble when they get, especially when they get injured or they retire. And sometimes one makes the other one, forces the other one. How do you not let demons of uncertainty get inside your head? Like when you tore your Achilles, are you not thinking like, uh oh, how am I going to come back from oh, this? Oh, God, yeah. 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 I was thinking, damn, I'm done. And I don't know if I can come back from this or my career could be over. Then what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Like I've I had those, and, but I think uh, what I've learned at an early age is you accept them versus fight them. You know, like if you're nervous or scared about a situation, instead of being like, "No, nah, there's nothing to be scared about, nothing to be scared about." Oh shit, there is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's fine. That's okay. You know, like you own it, you give it a hug, <laughs> you embrace <laughs> it, and now what are you going to do about it? It seems like studying everything in detail, breaking everything down into little pieces, would help in business. But I'm I'm wondering like. Now you've spent the bigger part of your life honing physical skills, mental skills. You've got kids now. Do you ever think about mortality, especially having leaned on your, your body for the first, the, your first career? Yeah. Now you're looking at your kids and nothing makes, I don't know about you, nothing makes me feel old or like, oh, I got kids now. I got to be careful. And I'm, I'm more fragile than I remember. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a weird mix. I'll tell you, like, when Bianca was born and when Capri was born. It was a it was a odd mix of like pure enjoyment and happiness and fulfillment, you know. But at the same time, it was a little sadness because I knew that my two older girls were going to age. Mm -hmm. You know, of course you know they're going to age, but like when you have like Bianca now is two and Coco's two months, like I'm like, you know, it's gonna be amazing when they're you know six and four. Mm -hmm four and two and then you're like oh wait a minute you know for her to be six that means Natalia is going to be 20 right right is going to be 17 and I'm like oh 
You know, <laughs> what do you think about well, where does that leave me? Like, well, I, I don't, I don't, I don't worry about that. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about like, man, my kids. Like, Natalia's almost out of the house. Like, she'll be 17 in January. 17. You know, and it just puts things in perspective. Like, damn, yeah. time has no mercy. <laughs> It's the one thing that no matter how hard you work, you can't control. Nah, man, I wish I just had like a TiVo button. Like, just pause it for a second. You know? Well, I wish, I wish you many more years of success, man. Thank this you, has man. been a lot of fun. Appreciate Thank you so it, much.